it is a real honor for me to be here. I, uh, Cornell is like a, you know, it's like the, the house on the hill for, for we hillbillies who grew up in East Tennessee. So I spent a lot of time during my early career at the vet school at the University of Tennessee, but, but Cornell is like legendary. So the fact that I'm actually standing here in, in these hallowed halls talking to anybody is kind of amazing, um, especially given my, my sort of humble beginning. I, uh, I'm going to start like I start with pretty much every presentation I give, and that is by telling a story. And I'll probably tell lots of stories because that's what I do. Um, in case you haven't figured it out, I'm Southern, and we tell stories, lots of them. And they're not, they're, sometimes they're even somewhat true. Not usually terribly true, but at least there are bits and pieces of truth in them. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story because I think it's really important to set the stage. If we're going to talk about how we're evolving as an industry and sort of where we're headed and the work that still lies in front of us in this industry, I think it's really, really critically important that we honor where we came from. And I would venture to guess that I've got shoes that are older than most of the people in this room at this point, even though I got a nice compliment about looking terribly young, which I, I'm not sure what that's, I don't know if she's jockeying for a drink later or what, but I, I, <laughs> I certainly appreciate it. I, I, most days I don't feel horribly young. Um, I, I am the father of three adult children and five grandchildren, um, so that if, if that doesn't make you feel old instantly, I don't know what will do it. But I want to talk a little bit about sort of my beginning, because I think my beginning, I, I feel like I've been in this industry since the beginning of time. Um, it, it hasn't been quite that long, but it feels that way in a lot of ways. I, I actually, about a month ago, a little less than a month ago, I passed the 35-year mark. Of, of working in animal welfare. So how many, how many other folks in here have passed 35 years? Handful, that's awesome. We should like start like a, a, a club of some sort. We'll call it the Space Cowboys Club. Remember that movie Space Cowboys where they brought like Clint Eastwood out of mothballs and had him save the world? We should do that. We should all form our own little Space Cowboy group to do the same thing. So I stumbled into this field, like many of you probably did, although it's really amazing to me. Nowadays, there are so many people in animal welfare who are here on purpose, and I love that. I love the fact that we have actually laid a foundation for bringing folks along to take over for us when we're too old and tired to do this anymore, because for a lot of us, that's fast approaching. So it's really encouraging to me that folks are actually now very intentionally seeking out career paths to bring them into this field. When I got into it, nobody did that. It, it, we, were a, we were quite a hodgepodge of folks. Um, I stumbled in. I was, I was at the University of Tennessee. I got my degree in animal science, my bachelor's degree, and, and I, my, my big plan was to apply for vet school. I, I had planned that since I was in first grade that I was going to, I was going to be, I, before I knew what a veterinarian was, I called it an animal doctor, and that's what I wanted to be from the time I was six years old. And I got to about midway through my junior year in college and, and, and sort of took a turn, took a little bit of a, a turn in my life, not just in my, in my career plan. And I actually got married my, right before my senior year, and I married somebody who had two kids. Um, so I'm 21 years old. I think I've got the world by the tail, and suddenly I've got a five-year-old and a two-year-old that actually went to class with me, which was really interesting um, because I was, I was a snot-nosed kid myself. I thought I was so smart and so large and in charge, but I really wasn't all that swift um, at all. So my, my career path sort of took a turn. I got my degree, and I'm like, well, now what do I do? I, I, I really can't afford to go to vet school. I've got a family now to raise, and I've got other things that I need to do. So I'm not going to go that route at this point. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do with a degree in animal science? Which, quite frankly, I don't know if it's still the case, but in my day, that was basically a degree in factory farming, um, which was ironic for somebody who was not a meat eater. Uh, a lot of my professors thought that they had, I had really they, they'd lost one when they found out that I, I was also a vegetarian. Um, and I was asked to be on the meat judging team, by the way, I was, I was, because I was really good at it, um, even though I wouldn't eat it. it, was, it, was, it my life is filled with those kinds of little ironies, I guess. 
So the, the local Humane Society, we're in Knoxville, Tennessee, the local Humane Society is advertising for a shelter manager. And I had some really, really lame notion of what the Humane Society was all about, what they did, but I didn't really know. Um, but I thought, you know what, I've got a degree in animal science and it's a humane society that handles animals. So there's got to be some sort of relation there. There's got to be some sort of relevance to what I know in this position. So I threw my name in the hat as a lark and ended up getting the job. I didn't discover until a few weeks later that the only reason I got the job is because I was the only person they could find willing to work that cheap. Um, I thought I was making a million dollars. It was so nice just to have a real job for a change. So I walk into the shelter on the very first day, and I'm, I'm at this point 23, and, uh, and I had a college degree, right? I had a, I had a bachelor's degree. Therefore, I am going to fix all of the problems within the first year or so, and then I'll just rest on my laurels for the rest of, the, of my career. I'll go find something else to do. I'll go find a real job. I can remember actually using that phrase myself. One of these days, I'm going to give this up and go find a real job. I actually go to family weddings even now, and I've got uncles and aunts who will come up to me and ask me when I'm going to get a real job. 35 years in, and they're still asking. Um, so it's interesting that people, a lot of times, they just don't appreciate the fact that this really is a real job. They think, you know, think about what your friends and family, what your circle of folks think. They think that you go to work every day and just sit on the floor and snuggle puppies, right? They don't realize that you're actually like juggling fire in the air every day when you go to work. So I'm at this little shelter, and, and, and honestly, to call it a shelter is sort of an exaggeration. It was a tiny building. It had been built in the 1950s as a county maintenance facility. It was never meant to be an animal shelter. It was never meant to be much of anything. And when I took it over, it was literally being held by duct tape and a prayer. Uh, there, was, there was very little there to, to, to work with in that facility. In that tiny little shelter, and I'm talking about, I'm going to be generous and say that facility was 4,000 square feet, give or take, the whole thing. We were handling 14,000 animals a year through that shelter. Shelter. 14,000 animals a year. We had a staff of 12 people. We had a budget of about $300,000 for the year. We had contracts with both the city and the county to provide housing for the animals that their animal control officers picked up and brought to us. So, you know, I, you're, you're all smart people. You can do the math yourself. I, I don't have to tell you what that looked like. Um, we were basic, basically a euthanasia factory. And we were not unique. We were, we were, that was really the norm in our country at that time, particularly in the South. We were lucky because at least our shelter wasn't located right next door to the landfill, which is where most, of, of the, uh, most shelters were located back in those days. So it was, a, it, it, was a, it was a harsh lesson for me, the 23-year-old brilliant, I remember I had a college degree, person walks in and I'm going to, I'm like, well, this is all great that this is the way we do things now, but like in six months, we're going to be doing things completely differently. And, and then I, the reality started to sneak in and I thought, okay, I really need to start checking the classified ads again. There's got to be a better way to make a living than this. Um, if you had told me after six months in that shelter, in that business, that I would still be doing this two years later, I would have laughed you out of the room. And now, 35 years in, I honestly cannot imagine doing anything else. It, it is, I don't have to tell you this, it gets in your blood, and it really is not about what we do every day, but it's really about who we are as, as human beings. So, it was a, it was a tough place to work. Uh, we had, we had walk-in, or not walk-in, when I first started, we had chest-type freezers where we put the animals that we had euthanized every day, and then we had to haul them at least a couple of times a week, we had to haul them to a, a rendering plant where they were ground up into bone meal. Um, and and it was just, that was just the way we did things. The worst, single worst day of my entire life, and I've lost both of my parents, but the single worst day in my life was a day that I was driving the truck that was going to the rendering plant. We had a pickup truck that was 100 years old and had a lift bed on the back of it that worked some of the time. And I had, to, I, I had gotten mad at most of the staff, and I had fired a bunch of people, which meant that I was having to carry a lot of the workload. 
So I'm driving to the rendering plant to dump a load of, of, of euthanized animal carcasses. And this is rush hour traffic about 4.30 in the afternoon. I got off the interstate, went under an underpass, and the truck died. So it's a million degrees, it's July. I've got a bunch of bloaty bodies in the back of this truck and I'm having to move them from one truck to another. It was, it was bad, folks. It was really bad back then. And I don't tell you that to gross you out or to, to, to sort of offend you or for sympathy for me at all. I tell you that because I think it's really, really important to understand where we came from. That wasn't that long ago. 35 years in the scheme of things, not a lot of time. And think about where we've come in 35 years. I mean, now we have most organizations, if they euthanize animals at all, do so with, with major um, committee level decision making happening. And, and we go through every other possible alternative before we get there. For every individual animal, we, we agonize and we stress and we consider all the other options for that animal before we make that call. That's phenomenal. Think about that. Think about coming from, from where we were 35 years ago to that in my lifetime. I never thought I'd see the day. We'll talk in a, in a little bit about about the whole situation with animal relocation transport programs. You know, I, I, I totally understand the concept of transporting dogs from one place to another because there's, there's you know, bigger demand and, and lesser supply in certain parts of the country. But the first time somebody told me that they were transporting cats because there was a place that, that had a shortage of kittens, I actually cried a little bit because I couldn't believe that that was happening in my lifetime. I never thought I'd see it. I never thought that we'd be having the conversation that we're having today about the evolution of the industry. I thought we would still be fighting the, 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 the really tough fight in the beginning. So when you think about, when you have a bad day today in the scheme of things and the way things look today, if you have a bad day, just think back to that or give me a call and I'll, I can tell you some more stories about some of the things that we got to deal with back in those days. We are standing on the shoulders of a lot of people who made a lot of this stuff happen. So never ever let yourself be fooled into believing that this stuff is easy and that where we are now we got because of, of, of just one or two people wanting, wanting something to change. We got where we got today through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and because there were a lot of us who, who didn't find the way things were acceptable and we said we are going to fix this. One way or the other we are going to fix this. And in my lifetime, we're fixing it. It's crazy. I, the, my, my big regret is that there, I've got friends and colleagues who, who have passed on. That's one of the weird things about getting a little bit older is that you find yourself going to more funerals or, or reading more obituaries about people you know. Um, I went to a funeral not too terribly long ago of a colleague and, and I'm sitting through the service and they're playing all the standard like animal hymns, right? They're playing all things bright and beautiful and all creatures great and small and they're, they're reading passages that really speak about animals and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is like my funeral. This is weird, it's a little creepy. I'm not quite ready yet. I still got stuff to do, got work to do. So anyway, if you ever get to that place where you think you're having a bad day, just remember those days and, and, and think about how far we've come, how fast. Um, and I have nothing but high hopes. That's, the, that's what I love the most about coming to conferences like this, is that I get to look up into the audience and I get to see people with these young, bright, energetic faces and I get to realize that it's okay. Like, there are people to pass the torch to. For years, that was what kept me up at night. I'm like, oh my God, what, who's going to do this when I'm too old and broken down to do it anymore? But you guys are here and, and you're all over the country and thank heavens for that. So. That's, that's my, see I've used up half my time telling my story. That's, that happens to me. I'll tell a lot of those. Um, so I think one of the challenges we have as, as an industry is that we tend to be really, really stubborn people. We are very, ch for, for folks who are innovative, we tend to be very change resistant in a lot of ways. Some of us are really scared of anything new, any sort of new ideas or concepts. I can tell you I was around the, when, when we first introduced the idea of actually doing adoption applications and asking people questions before we adopted pets out to them. 
We didn't have that. When I first started, we didn't even have that. So, and, and once it came on the scene, we're all like, oh, well, that's kind of scary. Should we, I mean, I don't know if we can do that or not. People may stop adopting if we ask them a question or two. So basically, if you came in the shelter and you were sober and had, and had money, um, you, you pretty much walked out with whatever animal you wanted. And then we went to a different place, right? Then we, we started asking questions, and then we got militant about it. And nobody was worthy of adoption from us. And there are still groups like that. I, I've dealt with a few of them. I, I worked with a, a golden retriever rescue group when I was working in the pri for a private sector company. I worked, a golden retriever group came to us asking for a grant. And I found out that three of our senior employees at the company had been rejected for adoption by this rescue group. So I started digging into their adoption processes and policies a little bit. And I actually called the person in charge and said, can you walk me through your, your protocols? And she did, and, and at the end of it, she said, isn't it wonderful that we ha handle so few animals that we can be that picky? And I said, well, actually, it'd be a lot more wonderful if you would be a little less picky so you could handle a whole lot more animals and help a whole lot more if, if you want the truth of the matter. She rejected folks who, she rejected one of our VPs who had spent $40,000 in chemotherapy over several courses of treatment for his golden retriever that he finally lost. Um, and the dog came to work every day. One of the conference rooms in the office was named after the dog. And they turned him down because he traveled too much. So, yeah. So I think we, there, is, there is such thing as maybe going a little too far. So my first commercial message for my own organization, the Association for Animal Welfare Advancement, formerly known as SAWA, is your professional association. If you have anything to do with the operation of an animal welfare organization, then you really should be involved with us. The, there, there is great strength in our coming together. So we offer all kinds of great training programs online and all kinds of great training programs at live conferences and all of that. And that's all great, but the, but, but the real benefit of being a part of the association is the network. I can promise you that I would not be standing here 35 years in had I not connected with this group early on and discovered that I was not in this by myself, that nobody is an island. So I would go to a conference, and I'm, you know, I'm just this kid who doesn't know anything, and I would go to a conference, and I would insert myself right into conversations with some of the biggest players in the industry because those were the brains that I wanted to pick. So when Elizabeth said, make a new friend and make sure you put yourself out there at this conference, I can tell you, you're going to get out of it exactly what you put into it. So put everything you've got into it and, and don't be shy. Don't feel like you can't interrupt conversations. Don't feel like you can't invite yourself to dinner with people you don't know. Uh, trust me, you can do it. I've done it. I've absolutely done it. I, and I'm still here to tell about it. It wasn't that scary. And I've, because of it, I've got friends all over the country and in, in several country, other countries as well from this industry. There is almost no place in the United States of America that I could travel to today where I would not have an invitation for a place to stay. And that's not because I've got a stunning personality. It's because I'm, it's, it's because I'm not afraid to talk to people and ask a lot of hard questions and accept a lot of hard answers. So don't be shy, join your own professional association and become part of the network. So my mission in life and the real mission of our organization is to Im continuously improve the level of professionalism in animal welfare. It's, 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 it's my life's calling. If I get nothing else done, we're going to make sure that we are looked at as true professionals around the country. Uh, like I said, I still have family members who ask me when I'm going to get a real job because they completely don't get what it is that we do as an industry. They really don't get it. But, but they will if we keep moving in the direction we're moving. Today's animal welfare professional is, is required to have a whole different set of skills than any we've ever been required to have in the past. I mean, we're, if you look around the country at some of the most successful organizations in the country, they are, they're, they're, it's big business, right? We're not, we're not your little mom and pop shops anymore. There are plenty of organizations that have 10 plus million dollar budgets and hundreds of employees on their payrolls, and they're making a huge difference in their communities. Um, 
so it's this this is not some easy little thing it's not something i i was amazed when i i, I ran a shelter in in upstate new york called lollipop farm many of you probably know it um over near rochester and when i left it, it was by the way next to the job i have right now it was the best job that i ever had and it was i i always believed the whole time i was there i believed i could i could i could fight my way through winter and i could retire from this job um, I could stay here long enough to retire because I loved it that much. It's, it's a, it was a stunning organization and a, a fantastic experience for me. Um, oh my God, I, lost, I completely lost my train of thought. I got so excited thinking about my old organization, I lost my train of thought. Oh, when I left there. When I left there, the first two people who applied for my position, one was a high school biology teacher and the other was a real estate agent. And I looked at these, at these application packets, and I'm like, you know what? This is kind of our fault, because we make it look so easy. You know, we, we're, like, we're, we're like the ducks, right? A, a, the, the part of us that's above the surface looks all calm and collected, while the part that's below the surface is working 1,000 miles an hour. So people thought it was, all you had to do was love animals. If you loved animals enough, you can run a humane society with a $4 million operating budget. And, you know, a 50,000 square foot facility and 70 employees and 380 volunteers. And it's, it's a piece of cake. All you got to do is love animals enough. So we're struggling now to make sure that that attitude changes and that folks realize that the people in this industry are pros. We've got to be more politically astute than we've ever been. We've got to think really strategically. Most of the people I know in this industry, even those with really big budgets and big reserves financially, still squeeze every penny like it's their last. And those are the people that tend to be the most successful. So we've got to be very strategic in, what we, in every decision we make. Everybody we hire, every program we start, everything we do involves strategy. If you visit our website, which is theaawa.org, um, there's a section there on certification. And I encourage you to take a look at it because in the, un, under the tab where, you, where it talks about preparing for certification, for taking our exam, there you, you can read all about all the core competencies that we've identified. We put together a group of people, about 20 professionals from across the industry, big organizations, small organizations, senior managers, middle managers, volunteers, put a whole group of people together and we spent a lot of time working on what we called a job analysis. And in that job analysis, we came up with five domains, sort of five core competency areas that we would test folks on for, for certification. And if you read that, you really get a good feel because it's things like leadership, like human resources management, financial management, analysis, being able to do reports, things like that, fundraising development, communications and public relations. I mean, how many other businesses do you have to have, one, does one person have to have all those skills in one? Most, most companies have got huge departments to handle each one of those things. We don't have that. Each one of us has to be able to do it on our own. So that's another reason I really encourage you to join the, the association and network with your peers. So, our field has changed dramatically, and these are, these are just a couple of screenshots I pulled off the internet of reasonably new shelters that have been constructed in the last little bit. It's really funny. Different communities have experienced different levels of success. A lot of it, is, it has to do with geography, quite frankly. If you're in the Northeast or the Upper Midwest, your, your breeding seasons are shorter. So getting, uh, getting pet overpopulation under control may have been a tad easier. In the Northeast, there certainly have been far more progressive spay-neuter efforts over the years than there, there were in the Deep South. So in large parts of the country, we don't have overpopulation per se anymore. Now you go to the Deep South, you go to Louisiana, go to Alabama, go to Mississippi, Tennessee where I live now, Look around down there and you'll see that, 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 that we're, we're far from done with all the work. But, and we're gonna talk about this in a minute, I think we, we're largely now not dealing with overpopulation, we're dealing really with more of a distribution problem. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and relocation. So this is kind of where we are, this is what we've evolved to. But you know what keeps me up at night? What keeps me up at night is we made a lot of progress 
in a really short period of time, how long would it take us to, to end up right back there if we're not vigilant, if we don't pay attention to what's going on in, in the world as a whole? We tend to be really myopic in this field. How many, of you, how many of you ever give a lot of thought to what's happening outside the walls of your shelter when you're in the middle of the heat of the day? Very few of us. We tend to be very shelter-centric, very shelter-focused. And it's really time for us to get beyond that because it would not take much, I don't believe, for us to end up right back in that same boat where shelters are full of animals that are unwanted and we're having to make euthanasia decisions on healthy puppies every day. I don't want to go back there. That's the thing that scares me the most in life, is, is the, the notion of going back there. But, and we're going to talk about this a little bit in a minute, but remember, we're at a place where we're seeing, we're seeing a shortage of available pets for adoption in a lot of parts of the country, in shelters. And there, but there's still a high demand. Folks still want their pets, and they're going to, they're going to get them somewhere. So who's going to fill that vacuum for us? That's something we need to, we need to definitely think about. And if we backslide, we could end up here. And let me tell you something. These look like pictures that I, that I dug up from my, the beginning of my career. These, these are, are pictures that are cur fairly current of so-called shelters in, in various parts of the country. I don't, I, I don't put the skinny dog picture up there just to, to get the oohs and ahs and oh no's. I put that up there because that dog got in that condition at a so-called shelter. That's not acceptable. And we, we have got to be, we're better than that and we've got to be better than that and we've got to hold ourselves accountable to not letting ourselves be associated with anybody who thinks that that's, that's okay. So that's what scares me, folks. Let's don't go back to where we, we used to be. You know, let's, let's either close these folks down or pull them up by the bootstraps and help them to be better and to grow and to, to be part of our industry as opposed to really being kind of the enemy of, of, of what we're trying to accomplish. So where have all the dogs gone? It's crazy. Like, you, you come up anywhere up in this part of the country, you go to a shelter, and there's nobody to adopt. Very few, right? I mean, I, I lost one of my dogs back in March, um, and, and I, I did what most of us would do. I, I left the veterinarian's office and drove straight to the closest animal shelter. Um, because I had an opening now in my house, and I've got to fill that. I, it's, it was going to drive me crazy till I did. So I visited about five shelters that day, and even in Tennessee, even in eastern Tennessee, which is pretty rural, right? I mean, that's like the, it's the land of the stereotypical hillbilly. Um, even there, there was nobody for me to adopt in those shelters. There were a lot of, there, there were a, a, a number of dogs there, but none of them were, were what I had in my, in my mind as the perfect companion to fit into my existing pack. So I ended up going to a local rescue group and I had a really great experience with them and, and ended up with a, a little puppy that I'll show you later because that's the only reason PowerPoint was invented was so we could show pictures of our pets at some point during every presentation. So I, I, I'm often asked why I don't put pictures of my grandkids in there and I, I don't really have a good answer for that. They're not, because they're not my pets. Um, so I think it's important for us to realize, while, th while that's great, like, I mean, to me, that's like a measure of success, right? Shelters don't have enough dogs to meet the demand. But we've become so fixated on ourselves as adoption agencies and very little else that in some shelters, it's causing them to have sort of a, 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 a crisis of identity. Like, who are we if we're not adopting out dogs every day? What are we going to do now? We're going to talk about that in a second. I do want to make sure that you all know that, that this, this lack, this shortage of available pets is going to be filled by somebody. I mean, the demand is still there. We all have that demand, right? You're not going to, you're, you're not going to like say, oh, well, there aren't enough dogs up here, so I guess I just won't have dogs anymore. No, we're going to find dogs somewhere, right? You're going to drive to Alabama if you have to to, to get a dog. That's, that's what drives us. Um, the pet industry is also very keenly aware of the fact that there's a shortage of dogs in, available in animal shelters. And the pet industry is doing something about it. And they're working on things like breeder standards to try and make sure that they can weed out some of the bad actors in, in, in the breeding world. 
we actually, my organization was invited to participate in something called the Pet Leadership Council. And that is a group that was made up primarily of folks from the pet industry to address this very issue of what happens. Where, how do we source those dogs of the future? And, and I, I'm here to tell you that somebody's going to fill that niche. And, and if we aren't careful, and if we don't participate in that conversation, and if we're not willing to think a little bit outside of our norm, which would, our, our norm would be, oh, you're a breeder, I can't have a conversation with you, you're disgusting. Um, we can't do that anymore. We don't have that luxury anymore because the breeders are out there and there are going to be more and more of them. And if we don't work with them, if we don't work with the responsible breeders, then we're going to end up back in a place where puppy mills are cranking them out so quickly that, that we, we can't keep up and they're going to end up coming into our shelters again in droves. So it's really important that we th start thinking. I, I, I sort of refer to them as non-traditional allies, right? I mean, these are not people we've, we've historically had sort of uh, any fondness for or been willing to work with, but we're going to have to. And I think if we do, if we play our cards right and we have something to say about things like breeder standards, then, then we can help regulate the, the way that this all comes to pass. Many of us around the country have, have focused on things like um, passing laws to ban the sale of dogs and cats and animal in, in pet stores in our communities. It's really hard for me to argue that that's a bad thing. I think, fine, let's ban all we can. But if you think about the, the number, the sheer number of pets that pet stores are accountable for, it's really small. Take a look at the numbers of pets that are being traded and sold and bought on the internet. Take a look at the number of dogs that are being imported from, from outside the country for sale, for resale, purebred dogs. It's huge. I mean, the numbers are absolutely massive, and there's very, very little regulation of any of that. So it's really important for us that we get, on the, we get in on the front end of this. It can be tough, you know? It can be tough to have conversations with folks that we haven't traditionally considered our friends. Um, and, and there have been many times when I've had to sort of, you know, choke a couple of times before I've actually said something to somebody. But, but I'm telling you, it's, it's where we have to be if we want to put that backstop into place so we don't end up back in a situation of overpopulation. There's a lot of competition out there still as, in terms of sourcing for companion animals. And shelters have continuously gained market share. I mean, we continuously have added percentages to the numbers of animals that are coming from our facilities versus those that are purchased from breeders or pet stores or, or other sources. There's a huge demand, like right now it's the politically correct thing to do. To, to, I mean, how many people do you know who are, and every, every dog that gets rescued, every single one of those dogs has this crazy story, right? Oh yeah, she was abused. She was horribly, she, she's afraid of men because men abused her. Like, if my husband goes like this, she goes like this, and it's like, well, I wonder why. <laughs> I'm not sure she was abused. Maybe she just is smart. She's, she knows to duck when she sees something coming at her. So, um, but it, it, it's worked in our favor, right? People want to do the right thing. It's, I, I kind of compare it to smoking. I, I remember a time when everybody in every animal shelter in America smoked like nine packs a day. Right? I mean, you had to just to survive the day. So you, everybody would be gathered outside, by, by, beside the dumpster, going at it every, every break they got. Now, it's like they have to hide behind the dumpster because it's so politically incorrect anymore. And I think that's sort of what we're seeing with, with this demand for, for kind of doing the, for the rescue, making sure that you're, it, the, the best breed is rescue. Um, and, don't, and, and that's potastic, right? I, it, uh, some of the language that we use in some of our fundraising still kind of freaks me out a little bit. You know, shelters have gotten a lot more open-minded about our adoption processes. We're, we're, we're trusting people. We actually assume that if somebody comes to the shelter, they're probably there to do something nice and to do something good. You know, they're probably not really all Satanists coming in for a sacrifice. Um, we used to think that stuff... I mean, I, I was part of it, man. We used to, at Halloween, we would shut down for a week um, because we, and wouldn't let anybody adopt a kitten because every kitten was going to be sacrificed to the Church of Satan during that week. I, it probably was all mostly in our head. We all, I don't think many of us ever saw a whole lot of evidence that that really happened. But man, we did it. We did the same thing at Christmas time, right? At Christmas time, we shut down for weeks. 
because pets do not make good gifts. And then somebody actually stopped and did a study, and it showed that pets given as gifts at Christmas time actually tended to stay in the home longer than pets that were actually purposefully gotten outside of that situation. So now we've got shelters all over the country who are do- delivering puppies to homes on Christmas morning or Christmas Eve. So it's, it's, we, we've come a long way in that regard. We also have decided that maybe we can actually move animals from point A to point B. Somebody who used to be with the ASPCA actually said it to me years ago, and, and it has stuck with me. She said, the only, the only thing standing between this animal and a future and a life is a ride. And if we can give them a ride to the right place, we can get them a home. So transport has become a tremendous life-saving tool for us, and I think will continue to be a tremendous um, tool for us moving forward. It's interesting, though. It, 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 it's like everything else we do. There's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And one of the things that we as an organization have really prided ourselves on is we've put together teams of subject matter experts who have written best practices documents to make sure that if somebody is going to undertake something like transport, they have a roadmap to follow in order to do it right. We don't want folks out there. I, the very first transport that I ever got involved in, and Barbara Carr will remember this as well, we took a load of puppies from South Carolina, and we trusted these folks. They, 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 they knew exactly what to say to us on the phone about the vaccination protocols and all of that. And we had great faith that we were going to get these, this, truck, this trailer load of beautiful, healthy puppies. And every one of those puppies had parvo. Um, they, were, they showed up in a, tr- in, a, in a livestock trailer with absolutely no ventilation and no climate control. And they all had, they opened up the trailer and they all, there was like bloody parvo diarrhea all over that trailer. So there's, there, there's a right way and a wrong way to do everything. And if we're going to do this, we owe it to those animals. We owe it to our communities to do it right, to follow the true best practices. So those are available on our website if you're not familiar with them, and we're, we're doing them on a whole cadre of different issues and topics within the industry. So be sure and take a look at those. So what's the problem? Our problem today is a whole lot different than it was in 1984 when I stumbled into my first animal shelter. But our biggest challenge, one of our biggest challenges at least, is that we don't know what the problem is. We have done a really lousy job of measuring anything over the years. A really lousy job. We don't like, in our field, like we don't like to evaluate stuff because I think we're a little bit afraid of what we might find out. So we're really hesitant to to open up our books and really take a look at where where things really stand. In many cases, for many years, there there was such terrible record keeping, we couldn't have done it if we wanted to. You know, we were doing everything manually. We were putting everything down on paper. A shelter is the wettest, most disgusting environment in the universe. So every piece of paper gets soaked with, with you know, urine and bleach and roach poop and everything else. So all those records were lost before we actually decided to finally automate ourselves way back in the day. Um, so we don't know. We really don't know what the problem is. We've had guesses. If you look back at at historic records, you'll see all kinds of guesses. The HSUS would guess certain big numbers up in the tens of millions of animals. ASPCA had numbers that were up in the tens of millions of animals. And they were good, educated guesses, but they were guesses. That's all they were. And that's all they've been up until very recently. Tomorrow, at this conference, there is a workshop that is being taught by Jody Buckman and Shelley Thompson on, on uh, using data in our facilities. Imagine that, it's a revolutionary concept. Like, let's actually look at facts before we make major decisions. There's an idea. So there's a new, or a relatively new project called Shelter Animals Count. And Shelter Animals Count is the first true national database to actually quantify the numbers of animals coming through the system, coming in and going out. And the, the beauty of Shelter Animals Count is that it doesn't pass judgment. It's not there to analyze the data and give you all sorts of opinions. It's there to give you good, raw data that you can then run your own reports and benchmark yourself against other communities of similar size and that sort of thing. So you're going to hear a lot. I'm not going to steal their thunder. Um, plus, I don't know nearly as much about it as they do. But be sure and attend that session tomorrow if you're not participating especially. Um, if you aren't, if you're, if, you're, if you're taking animals in, whether it's a rescue group or a shelter 
or whatever, if you're handling animals on intake and, and sending them out, then you need to be participating. You need to be submitting your data to Shelter Animals Count. And, and, and Shelly, wave your hand. If you, if you don't believe me, ask her. She'll tell you. So another big change in our industry over the last maybe 10, 20 years is, is what I call the rise of the rescue. So rescues have popped up all over the place. There's always, we're going to talk a lot about fragmentation in our industry in a few minutes. Um, there have always been rescue groups. There have always been, you know, communities that have seven humane organizations in them. It's, it, it boggles the mind, but, but interestingly enough, a lot of animal people are not people people. I know, let's, everybody take a second to process that. So if you've ever done job interviews for, for this industry, that's, and you ask somebody why they want to work in animal welfare, what's the first thing they say? But, I try, I love animals, but I hate people. Which is like, a, if that's not a red flag, you know, I, I can't think of any effective team that's made up of a bunch of people haters. So I, I would suggest that you not hire those people if they're serious about that at all. Um, so what we've seen is, in, in many cases, there'll be one core animal welfare group. There'll be one humane society, one animal welfare group, and they'll, they'll somebody gets mad, right? Their, the, their agenda is not the, the, the primary agenda, or their, you know, whatever. They get upset about something. And so they, what do they do? They don't work through it. They take their toys, and they go across town and start their own humane society. So every community has three, four, five, six, seven humane societies. Or they have all these groups that will say, okay, that's fine. I'm just going to go become a rescue group. I love rescue groups. I think rescue has a tremendous place in, in the solutions to, to the issues that we deal with in, in animal welfare every day. Um, I think they are definitely one prong in, in our multi-pronged approach to making it happen. Um, I think they give us great opportunities for collaboration in communities. If, if folks are willing to play nice and put the animals first, there's nothing that can be more effective than collaborating with all these folks. I do, however, worry a bit that about once a month, I see a, a story on Facebook about a group that called itself a shelter or called itself a rescue that's being busted by law enforcement because they've got all kinds of animals living in dreadful conditions. So I think it's become really easy for folks who really are hoarders to sort of masquerade as, as legitimate groups. Social media and the internet have made that really easier for folks, right? It's so, anybody can have a website. And there's still plenty of folks out there who believe if, there's, if, it, if they have a website, they must be legit. So we've got to be really careful about that. Um, but I think there really is a place. There also are those groups that are willing to take basically anything that comes their way. There are other groups that are only willing to take animals of a specific breed or animals of a specific age or specific health condition or sp um, specific behavior status and that sort of thing. So there are those who really are, can, can be more effective than others in collaboration with other organizations in the community. So, but, they're, but they're an important asset, and I think we need to all keep working together for the betterment of animals. I think, you know, a lot of the expectations of what we stand for as organizations is being set now by people who aren't doing the work. Everybody in our industry is an expert. Everybody we deal with in the community is an expert. I, I, I used this the other day in, in, in a workshop, and, and it kind of fell on, on deaf ears, because most of you are too young to know who Lassie was. But Lassie was a TV dog, a, a, a collie who was really smart. And, uh, and everybody, Lassie was like an icon. She was like a pop culture icon when I was a kid. Um, she always saved Timmy from the well. It was, it was, it was a cool story every single week. But the challenge is, is that everybody who's ever watched an episode of Lassie or everybody whose next door neighbor has ever had a dog thinks that they are an expert in what you do every day. And they don't mind telling you how to do what you do every day and how to do it better. So it's, it, it can be a huge challenge when you've got folks like that who are setting the expectation for the community. Um, and quite frankly, let's face it, there are folks who take advantage of their particular position. If they're, not, if, they're, if they're only handling seven animals a year, then they're able to market in a very different way than the animal control facility in a community that's having to handle all the rest. 
So uh, it's their marketing. Marketing can be very well enhanced by by sharing just a piece of the of the equation and not sharing the whole story with everybody else. We love social media, right? It's like the internet. I, I, I Yep, and I, I was working in this field way before the, I was working in this field before there were cell phones. I remember my very first cruelty case having to run to a, a 7-Eleven and use their pay phone to call the police. So, uh, yeah, that's how old I am, people. So, I should get some points just for standing up up here. Uh, so, the internet and social media came along, and, and in many ways, it's the best of things and the absolute worst of things, right? I mean, we can communicate what we're doing. We can share our mission and share our work with people in real time. Um, we can communicate with each other. We, my organization has two members-only Facebook groups that are fantastic for people to share ideas and, and innovations with each other. So, it's great in that respect. But in the other, you flip that coin, and on the other side, there's that person hiding in the dark in their mother's basement, um, tearing you apart, right? I, uh, you, some of you may remember, about a year ago, last summer, there was, a, there was an organization out in um, New Mexico, I think it was, that started giving away these bumper stickers that said, Rehabilitate a Dog Euthanize an Animal Control Officer. That's, that's a really positive approach. To, to improving things in the world. I was, uh, I, I, along with a couple of other people, put together a workshop that we delivered at the New England Federation Conference this past spring, and then again at Animal Care Expo um, in New Orleans in the spring. And the, the, the workshop was called Going Through Hell, Keep On Going. And the idea really was to talk to people about how to manage sort of their lives as they were going through this continuous attack by people who either didn't understand what they were doing, who just didn't like it, and, and were tr in, in many ways trying to shoot the messenger. So we actually asked at the beginning of this workshop, and at, at Expo in, in New Orleans, we probably had three, 400 people in this room, and we a I asked for a show of hands, how many of you in this room would consider yourselves to be going through hell right now? And I wasn't talking about my workshop, by the way. Um, and I bet you two-thirds of the people in that room raised their hands. Um, it was, it was, it was eye-opening to sit there and watch that many hands go up. That many people felt like they were under attack at that moment in time. Most of whom were under attack simply for doing their jobs and, and doing the best that they could by the animals that, that, they, that they so deeply cared for. So, you know, I, I get really tired of that notion that I care more than you care. I, it really makes me crazy, and I think it's one of the things that has kept, kept our, our industry from making even more progress. Is, um, Steve Zawistowski, who retired from the ASPCA once years ago in a workshop, actually said, we are the only social movement that eats its young. And in some ways, he's re he was absolutely, and this was a while back, um, he was absolutely right. That, he said that before social media came along and before the internet made it easy for those folks to hide out in their, in their mom's basement and, and attack. So what are we going to do? The best revenge, in my view, is living well. And I think we've done a really great job in many communities, certainly up in this part of the country, of getting the, the, the problem in check. We're not seeing overpopulation in the classic sense anymore. I, no shelters are having to euthanize thousands of animals a year simply for lack of space, which is phenomenal. Um, but one of the things that we've done while we've been so inwardly focused is we really forgot to look at our communities. We forgot to look outside the shelter walls. And now it's time to do that. Now we've got the luxury of that. And frankly, we've got the obligation to kind of reinvent ourselves as an industry. We used to joke, and I, I think it was only kind of halfway joking, that, that we were the only business in the world trying to put itself out of business. And the reality is, is that there will always be a need for us. It's just a different need than it used to be. For so long, we were, all we thought about was adopt, we so focused on adoptions and moving animals through the system and having positive outcomes with as many as we could, that we forgot to think about what was happening out there in the community. We were, we were impacting and being impacted by a really small percentage of folks actually out in the world. 
Um, you know, we, they, we, the folks who were, were perpetrators of cruelty or the folks who were relinquishing pets or the folks who were coming in to adopt or reclaim pets. That was kind of our universe for, for many, many years. Now we have an obligation to get out there and actually shake the bushes a little bit and deliver services to folks beyond our shelters to define what we mean by community, and that's really up to you and your individual organizations to figure out what's our community, where, who do we serve. I will tell you that I think it's really in some ways criminal if you think, well, we've solved overpopulation in our county. Now, in the very next county over, they're still, their shelter's still packed full of animals. They, they don't have any money. They don't have any programs that are, are, are really going to help to enhance life-saving in the community. But that's over there. That's over in that county. In our county, we're in great shape. I think there's something a little bit criminal about that. I don't think we, any of us, I, think, I don't think any of us, have the luxury of declaring victory in our communities until, until we can declare victory everywhere. If, 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 if you, the county next over from you and the county next over from that are still struggling, then you haven't won nothing. It, you, we've got to continue to spread our, our influence and our impact into those communities in order to help them. One of the ways that we can do that within our own communities is to, is to really look outwardly. Start looking for those folks who have been underserved historically by our industry from the beginning. There are plenty of them out there. There are plenty of folks who are not getting, have not really gotten any great help from us. One of the biggest crises I think facing our industry and facing our country when it comes to pet ownership is this issue of, of equal access to veterinary care. And we're standing here in, in, this, you know, on, in this bastion of veterinary medicine talking about this, but there are plenty of folks out there who are, are, are loving, loyal, wonderful, terrific pet owners who cannot afford to provide adequate veterinary care to their pets. And some of those people will do that instead of eating. Some of them will do it instead of paying for health insurance or instead of paying for housing for themselves. They'll do what's best for their pets. Some of them will not. Some of them will relinquish their pets to shelters because they think that's their, their only outlet. It's their only avenue. They don't have any other choice because they can't afford a, an expensive surgery or whatever, you name it, they can't afford it. So what can we do to improve access to care? I, I would ask you all the question, does the, does the gentleman on the right of the screen have any less entitlement to the love and companionship of a pet than, than the woman in the little picture? I don't think so. I, I, I don't want to live in that place where we, we think that's okay. You know, we all hear it all the time. You'll see some homeless person walking a dog and, and you hear those folks passing judgment. Well, he shouldn't have that dog. He can't even feed himself. He doesn't have a place to live. Why does he have a dog? Well, why do you have a dog? Think about what you get from your dog. Think about what the relationships are that you have with your companion animals. And that man is just as entitled and probably more in need of, of that type of love and companionship than, than most of us are. And the other piece of this is, I guarantee you that that, that happy spokesmodel in the smaller picture there with all the beautiful pets, people like her are struggling to pay veterinary bills too. People like all of us. I mean, I know that most of you are in animal welfare, so you're bringing down the big bucks. But, and so veterinary care is not really an issue for any of us wealthy folks in this room. But, I mean, think about it. There are plenty of people I know who are, 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 are doing okay. Middle class folks have a nice roof over their head and drive a decent vehicle and are able to put groceries on the table every week. Um, but suddenly they're faced with a $6,000 veterinary bill for some surgery that their pet needs. I know a lot of folks who would, would struggle with making that decision, and they may consider euthanizing that pet or turning it into a shelter instead because they just can't afford, they, they, they're worried. It worries them. If they do have a little bit of money in savings, and most people don't, but if they do have a little bit of money in savings, do they want to deplete it for, for a surgery when, when next week it could be their toddler who needs surgery? and they've got to pay some big health, healthy deductible on an insurance policy if they're fortunate enough to have insurance. So it's not just the homeless or the, the folks living at poverty. It's, it's actually all of us who struggle a little bit with this. So, I mean, what's the solution? I think there are plenty of them, and I think I, I really have to believe that we as intelligent, educated animal welfare professionals 
and a bunch of veterinarians that we can figure this out. <laughs> we can find some really viable, healthy solutions for fixing this thing. Because it's, it's not just them, it's, it's all of us who are struggling. So, you know, ask yourself questions if you're in the veterinary profession. Is the platinum standard of care the only standard of care that's acceptable? Or can we do some other things? I can remember many times back in my early sheltering career, a broke, first of all, in 1984, a broken leg was a death sentence. If a dog came in with a broken leg, that dog was going out the back door. There was no question. Then we evolved to a place where, where the resources were a little better, the population was a little lower, so a broken leg would get fixed, but it would probably get fixed by being set in a cast of some sort, and that dog would go on cage rest, and most of them did just completely fine. But now they've got to have pins and plates and screws and wires, and uh, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all there. So I think we've got to really consider whether we, we can accept a, a different standard of care. I'm, I'm not going to call it a lower standard. I'm going to call it a different standard of care in order to, to meet the, the needs of the vast majority of pet owners out there in, in our world. Um, it, it's, vet bills are onerous. I think it's really important that we also remember that as animal welfare professionals, we have an obligation to work with our brethren on the veterinary side and vice versa. I can tell you when I first got into this field, vets and, and animal welfare folks did not like each other much. And, and certainly we didn't, there was no such thing as shelter medicine. Like uh, if a veterinarian was in a shelter, that was kind of where bad veterinarians went to die, um, you know, back 35 years ago. And now it's a viable career path and it's a profession, it's a specialty. I mean, it's phenomenal. Think about that. In 35 years, we've gone from, from like, oh, I'm not going in there, to I, that's, that's my career path, man. I'm going to work in that organization and make a difference in the world. When I was at Lollipop Farm, we started an externship program. Jan Scarlett sent veterinary students over, and they'd spend a couple of weeks with us. We actually bought the house next door to the shelter so we could set up a dormitory and put people up there so they could come and work in the shelter. And it was eye-opening. Some of you may have been involved in that. It was eye-opening for these folks, right? They came in and in two weeks in an animal shelter environment, they saw more than they may see in a lifetime of private practice. <laughs> I mean, there was a huge variety of stuff for them to see. So it's really important that we look at this as a, as a joint effort and continue to work together. We are working with the AVMA. We're working with the Veterinary Medical Association executives. Those are the folks who run state VMAs. We're working with both of those folks on, on collaborating. How can, we, how can we bring the two professions together to have the, the greatest impact? So I love the idea of collaborating, but of course, collaborating only takes you so far, and then, and then you need money. So this, this is from last year, but UT was given, I th Maddie's Fund gave, gave the University of Tennessee um, almost $3 million to, to work on this project, to work on really um, improving access to veterinary care to underserved populations. Dr. Michael Blackwell, who used to be the dean of the vet school at the University of Tennessee, is now in the College of Social Work and heading up that effort. And um, just about two weeks ago, there was a big summit at the University of Tennessee to talk about this and to continue moving it forward and really moving the needle to, to provide access to vet care. Um, Dr. Blackwell is like an evangelist when it comes to this stuff. Like you ought to hear him, t he's like a, he preaches it when he, get, when he starts going. So it's great to have people like that who are passionate and feel strongly. And now we've got the veterinarians, we've got the social workers, and we've got the animal welfare folks all thinking about this as an important social welfare issue, not just an issue that affects animal welfare. Behavioral support is another issue. It's something that you know, we're all doing. For many years we've done training classes, but I think we're, what we need to do is reach out beyond our shelter get into some of these communities that, that have not had access to behavior support and, and bring them in, help them. Maybe it's referrals to veterinarians for serious behavior treatment. Um, but behavior is, is, is another real key. Um, I think building pet-friendly communities, thinking way beyond, again, the shelter walls, thinking about pet-friendly housing in communities. You know, keep a directory, keep a list, go out there and talk to landlords and encourage them to be pet-friendly having transitional housing for folks who are in dire situations and need help. Um, Pet-friendly workplaces and pet-friendly businesses. You know, people like to take their pets where they go. So, you know, now if I go out, if I go out to dinner in the summertime, I'm not going anywhere that doesn't have a pet-friendly patio. 
even if their food's not that great. If I can bring my dogs with me to dinner, are you kidding me? And why wouldn't I? They eat dinner with me at home. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've got a terrier. I'm doing well if he's off the table. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier, we've really, it's important that we think about going from fragmentation to consolidation and really pooling our resources to work smarter and not harder all the time. Um, this is, I, I'm, I put this up here in total. I hate slides that have this many words on them. But I put this up there because Ann Reed, my friend from the Wisconsin Humane Society, who's like the queen of consolidation um, in, our, in our field, said this, and I, and I think it's important. The animal welfare field has been fragmented from its very beginnings. Sheltering organizations have been providing separate services for so long that we, didn't, we don't notice that we're doing it or wonder whether there's another choice. In fact, especially in today's world, our separateness has dramatic negative impact on our work and places all our organizations at risk. Just last week, there was an announcement that the Humane Rescue Alliance in Washington, D.C. merged with St. Hubert's Animal Welfare Center in New Jersey. Like, they're not next door to each other, exactly. But they saw this benefit in merging resources and being more efficient in the way they operate. Um, Ann Reed's organization, Wisconsin Humane, has merged with at least three other organizations in Wisconsin. So instead of three executive director salaries, now they have one executive director salary. Instead of three development directors, now they have one development director. So it's just, it's just logic. But, it, but we've gotten in our own way because we can't get along well enough to talk about things like merging. So we've got to get better than that and get away from that kind of nonsense. Economic viability is impacted certainly by that. I think we, uh, you know, we're, as, as our missions change, we're no longer the, the, the fluffy little adoption agencies, right? We're, 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 our missions are very, very different than they were even just a few years ago, which make, makes our fundraising messaging really different. We've got to be much more finesseful about the way we reach out and raise money, the way we, we steward our donors through that whole process in order to be economically viable. If you're a government animal care and control agency, it's always hard to get money out of the government, right? They, they, they tend to be really tight, and animal control is one of the first things that always gets hacked when the budget's tight. Um, and now it's gonna be even harder because you're not dealing with the same volume. You're not handling 40,000 animals a year in your shelter. Maybe you're handling 10,000, but they're, they're animals that are much more difficult to, to run through the system. They need a lot more intensive care and treatment while they're with you and they're staying longer. Try and, try and sell that to a city council member or a county commissioner. It's tough. We're in, we're in tough times economically, so we, we've got to stick together there as well. Dif that whole notion of difficult to place, there was a summit a number of years ago um, about this very issue and how can we define what's difficult to place. And, and we as an industry, a bunch of smart people in a room could not agree on what was difficult to place. Folks wouldn't agree that an animal that had killed somebody was, was impossible to place. Um, I, you know, we've got to be sensible. Like, we've got to realize that, that there, are, there are mentally ill people in this world and there are mentally ill animals in this world and there are animals that I don't want sharing my neighborhood and, and you probably don't want them sharing yours either. I love them all, but, but I, I want the best for them and sometimes the best for them is not to go from place to place to place and ultimately end up, um, you know, in a, in a really bad situation because they've hurt or killed somebody. So we've got to be more sensible than that. We did a survey last year and asked folks, what, what are your most difficult to place dogs? And they said behaviorally challenged was the number one answer. Um, pit bull types were the number two. That's certainly an issue almost everywhere. And, uh, and then animals with medical challenges rank third. So there's still the question of cats. And uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've tried to kind of generalize and talk about all animals, but the truth is, that cats have always kind of taken a back seat in our, in our industry in a lot of ways. We, uh, we've, we've tended to sort of just lump them in, right? If you look at a lot of the, the ordinances, city and county ordinances, and even state laws that were written back in, in the 60s, 70s, early 80s, the language is, you know, it's laws pertaining to dogs and cats. So we always sort of treated cats like they were little dogs. And we all know that they're not. They're very, very different critters. They, people bond with them differently. You know, there have been those studies done. If, some, if you lose a dog, people start looking within an hour of discovering their dog's missing. If they lose their cat, they start looking within three or four days because they just assume he's going to come back. So it's, they're, they're very different creatures, very different beasts. And the way they interact with us, the way they interact with the environment and wildlife 
And all of those things are still questions for us that need to be answered. And I think we've got a tremendous amount of work to do yet with cats. Even in those communities where they're importing cats for adoption, which I still, it still chokes me up when I think about it. Um, we've got to start thinking about cats differently. We also are starting to see more and more of cat, the cat transport. When we redid our, our transport best practices, we actually really beefed up the whole section on cats because we had left them out in a big way. So my last shameless plug of the evening, and I know I'm the only thing standing between you all and wine at this point. I'm starting to feel the tension just a little bit. I can actually see the glow of a little bit of sweat in the room. So I do want to encourage you to consider joining the association. And I'm not doing that for self-serving reasons, although I love to see our membership grow. I'm doing it because I really believe that you will find tremendous value in that network of people. I know I have, and a lot of my colleagues have. We've got great resources for you. We've got a couple of Facebook groups that are members only, so you can safely ask hard questions and get a lot of feedback from people in real time. And then again, we have a lot of training like this, much of which is, is online now. So we have a, a new learning center we just launched last fall, and it's, it's going great guns. And finally, I want to thank you. This, these are the reasons that I do what I do, and, the, and, and in many cases, the reasons I get up in the morning. This is my current family. Um, they are, it, it changes. <laughs> If I had done this just a few months ago, there would have been some different images on this slide. But they are, uh, they're, 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 they're kind of my life. And I know for you all, you've, you've got your own, you could put your own slides together that would look very similar. Although most of you probably are smart enough not to bring a macaw into your life. <laughs> um, anybody here from Lollipop Farm? He was, I was, I was the, the, CEO at Lollipop Farm and this bird came in as part of a big cruelty case and, and he was completely freaked out so I'm like put him in my office and let's just let him calm down for a couple of days. That was 21 years ago. <laughs> so he has now moved from, from up here to down there with me and, and his, his office is right next to mine and so every time I get on, the, on any kind of a telephone call he starts chiming in and gets really loud. And then the little white dog is Emmy. She's the one I adopted from a rescue group in March. And she is a, she's, she's been kind of a, a game changer for us. She's, she's she, maybe the reason that I don't look as old as I should because she's keeping us young and on our toes. So, uh, and then Murphy, my horse, is 29 years old. And um, I also adopted him from Lollipop Farm as an eight-year-old. And I, I tell people all the time, for about 10 years, people would ask me how old he was. And I would say, he's nine. And then I realized that maybe he wasn't still nine, ten years later. So he is now 29 and, and going strong. I, every morning, I start my day by walking down to the barn, which is two miles from my house, um, up and down some pretty good little mountains. And I go to the barn for my exercise. I walk into the barn. He's really happy to see me because I control the, the door to the food room. And I dump feed in his bucket, and I smush my face into the thickest part of his neck. And I take a big, deep breath of that horse neck smell. And for about 30 seconds, I'm 12 years old. And I don't give a damn if the world starts or stops as long as I can breathe that horse neck. So um, this is what animals do for me. And I know that's what they do for you as well. And I appreciate all that you've done and continue to do for them. I appreciate the fact that I can retire or die knowing that, 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 that the whole field is in good hands and that smarter people than me are taking it over. So thank you all very much.